I think we put this together in 24 hours. Because you know what I said? I said, I know he went to Lebanon. I know we went to Dartmouth and did something on antitrust, but I want to go back. Um, and so here we are. And I want to thank uh, Peter uh, so much. He had hosted me uh, at his house, and I was so proud. He literally auditioned a bunch of candidates uh, at his farm, and Polly as well. Well, that's a thing in New Hampshire, right? Uh, actually, one of my best uh, stories was out of Iowa, the former mayor of Cedar Rapids uh, named Kay. She had an hour-long breakfast with me, and at the very end, she said, I've got great news for you. And I said, what's that? She said, I'm 78% with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I feel it. Uh, but now is the time to make a decision. Um, we had so much fun at that debate last night. Yeah. I felt, you know, and, and Dartmouth will appreciate this, I felt like being from Minnesota, I had a home field advantage because it was in an ice arena. It was truly in an ice arena. It was a little cold, everything was fine. Um, and uh, it just gave me an opportunity to uh, tell America who I am. I know, as I said, that I do not have the bank account. Uh, I was just in a gas station getting some coffee and heard a Bloomberg ad over the thing. <laughs> Like, oh, whatever. Um, and I don't have the bank account uh, of some of my opponents, uh, and I don't have quite the name ID yet, uh, and I'm not a brand new newcomer to politics. Uh, but I have integrity, and I get this country. Um, and I think that when you look at your job right now, uh, you are the jurors, right? You are the jurors in this election. I just went through a trial, so it's on my mind. Um, and I sat there in the Senate, and you know, sometimes for 10, 11 hours a day. Um, I literally, at one point late at night, started looking at some of my colleagues' hair, and I thought they looked like founding fathers. I'm like, whoa, enough. <laughs> um, but I thought through why we're there. Um, what our country is all about. And it is actually the same thing I'm seeing everywhere. Uh, it is a decency check, this election. And I know the end of that impeachment hearing uh, was so, so disappointing for so many of us. But it doesn't really end there. It doesn't end there because the conduct uh, that we were talking about, uh, the fact that this is a president that puts his own private interests in front of our countries, uh, that puts his own partisan interests in front of our international interests, um, that literally puts himself first all the time, people know that. And then to see the bravery of my colleagues, my friend Doug Jones, uh, who is facing this really tough race in Alabama, and to not just uh, vote to impeach, uh, but to feel so strongly that it was the right thing to do. Or how about Mitt Romney uh, from our... Uh... You know things are getting a little out of whack when you mention the former nominee for the Republicans for president in a debate in New Hampshire and everyone cheers. Like things are, things are out of whack. Uh, and I think they're out of whack because people in this country get uh, that this election is an economic check. We know that. It's an economic check. As I see my friends with their red uh, cut drug prices now shirts, uh, they get this is an economic check because of the spiraling cost of pharmaceuticals, because of the fact that this uh, president, as we are in this great college town, has done nothing to make college more affordable. Um, as you look at how people are feeling in their everyday lives, as they're having a hard time affording rent and finding child care and the like. So we know this is an economic check because this isn't shared prosperity. Uh, when he signed that tax bill and he went down to Mar-a-Lago and he was in this fancy ballroom with all his friends, he literally said to them, you just got a lot richer. Was anyone here in that room? Okay, I, just, I just didn't want to embarrass anyone if you were there. I thought, well, let's just get it out of the way. You can raise your hand. But the point is that you weren't because they were just his pals. So this is an economic check, but it is so much more than that. It is a decency check on this president. It is. It is a... Uh... It is a patriotism check. It is about a president that stands on the world stage at the G20. And when uh, the reporter asks him, what about Russian interference in our election? He looks at Vladimir Putin, a ruthless dictator, and he makes a joke about it. 
Think about it. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have lost their lives on the battlefield standing up for our democracy and democracies around the world. That's what World War II was about. Think about those four little girls at the height of the civil rights movement in that church uh, in Alabama who lost their lives, innocence, simply because they were trying to be part of our democracy and other people were trying to push them away. The greatest moments in our country's history and the worst moments have been about democracy, have been about our Constitution. And New Hampshire uniquely understands that. The first state to ratify a constitution, that's pretty cool. Um, Bretton Woods, all of the incredible people uh, that you have had as leaders, including uh, being the first state in the country to send not one but two women to the United States Senator, who also, wait. I forgot the second part, that you are the one that sent the two women in United States history who served as governor and senator. You had the first one ever in history with Jean Shaheen, and then you add in Maggie Hassan a second. That is a true story. Um, by the way, there's only a handful of states that have had sent two women to the Senate, and Minnesota is the other one. So, you know, it's... it's uh, it is not just our forests and hockey and lakes and maybe the color green, my signs, my color, that we all have in common. Uh, uh, it is also that. So when you think about what he did on that world stage when Donald Trump makes that joke, he literally is making a joke about all those sacrifices. It doesn't matter. He'll make that joke to Vladimir Putin while the whole world is watching. So that is what's at stake here. And the decency check, I think about this uh, guy I met in Minnesota was my first glimmer of this. He uh, was a rancher, and he took me around on his ATV uh, tour of his cattle ranch, touring through these huge cows, and I thought, this is not a good way to die. We're dodging them. <laughs> and then he takes me inside his house. The media's left. Everyone's gone. And then he looks at me. He says, you know, we, we voted for Trump. And I said, what do you mean, the ranchers? Your family? He goes, no, I mean me. And he said, I just don't like to talk about myself. So I say we, and he said, we voted for Trump because we are mad about health care. And then he said, and then we saw him in front of the wall. And I said, no, no, the wall didn't get built. And he said, no, no, the CIA wall. And this guy remembers that the day after the inauguration, he saw it on TV, that our president stood in front of this sacred wall covered in the stars of CIA agents who had lost their lives in the line of duty, anonymous stars. And he gave this partisan, partisan speech about the size of his crowd. A lot of people didn't see that. This guy did. And then he said months and months later, he said the Boy Scout rally. And so he had been a scout. I explained to him that my husband uh, is from a family of scouts. My husband uh, has one of six boys. Uh, they, his mom and dad had four boys. They wanted a girl. She got pregnant again, and they had identical twin boys. <laughs> and they uh, lived in a trailer home uh, with triple bunk beds. And his parents are really active in scouts. And five of six of their boys became Eagle Scouts. And I never want to say which one didn't want to make it because I don't want to embarrass my husband. Uh, so this guy and I are talking about this. And then he said, yeah, that was really it for me. He said, when the tr president gave a speech, a uh, part partisan political speech in front of that Boy Scout jamboree, in front of a bunch of young, young people. He said, that was it. He said, I decided for me, he said, and he went like this, what I did was not patriotic for me. Then I'm in North Conway in New Hampshire, and there's a long line of voters, and they have these happy stickers on. I'm a reproductive rights voter. I'm a climate change voter. I'm a Supreme Court voter. And then this guy comes up in a brown jacket, no sticker, and I said, sir, you don't have a sticker on. And he leans over and he says, Ah, that, that's because I was a Trump voter, and they don't have stickers. Um, me, and he goes, these are my neighbors, and they don't know about it, so don't say anything. <laughs> and he goes, but I am not doing it again. That is what I'm talking about. So, when we look at a state where the margin was only 2,000 votes, 
That's what this state was. And we know that there's a U.S. Senate seat up in this state. You get to understand that not everyone agrees with everything that's said on that debate stage. As you know from yesterday, I don't agree with everything that's said on that debate stage. I don't. When they said, well, do we think a socialist should lead the ticket? I was the only one that raised my hand and said, no, actually, I don't. Bernie and I are friends. I appreciate his service, but I don't think he should lead the ticket. That's true. I said that. Some people may agree. Some people don't. But the point is, I was honest. I told the truth. I looked people in the eye and told them the truth. And my view is, when you're dealing with a president that has told over 15,000 lies, maybe we need someone that is straightforward. And maybe that is our path to victory. And the things... And the things that unite us is this, the thing that unites us is this, and that is that whether it is independence, fired up Democratic base, or moderate Republicans, we can agree on one thing, and that is that the heart of America is so much bigger than the heart of this guy in the White House. And as I sat, as I sat at that impeachment hearing, one of the things that I thought a lot about um, was what is it about Donald Trump, in addition to that he doesn't care about the rule of law? Four more years of him, the rule of law? Good luck with that. He thinks he's above it. Democracy, he thinks he can bulldoze through it. The American dream, he thinks he can choose who can live it. And as I sat there thinking about it, I realized, you know, one of the things that maybe most defines everything that loops it all together, he has no empathy for his friends, for his enemies, for the people that, you name it. It goes on and on and on. He doesn't. He blames everyone when something goes wrong. <laughs> he blames Barack Obama. That's one of his favorite people to blame. Uh, he blames the head of the Federal Reserve that he appointed. He blames the energy secretary that he nominated. He blames the generals that he commands. Uh, he blames, my favorite one, the entire kingdom of Denmark. Who does that? <laughs> And then just recently, he went after the Canadian prime minister for allegedly cutting him out of the Canadian version of Home Alone 2. That's, he did that, check it out. So when I think about that, and I think about the people that I have met all across this country, the dock workers in Michigan, the carpenters in Pennsylvania, the dairy farmers in Wisconsin, when I think about them, I think about how do they think about Donald Trump? Some of them voted for him, some of them stayed home, some of them didn't vote at all, some of them voted for other candidates. And what I finally realized that makes it flip for me is that old story of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that when he died, he was so beloved that they put him on a train, his body, and it went through from Georgia to Washington, D.C. And people spontaneously lined up on the train tracks to show their respect. And there was this one part of the tracks where this guy was just sobbing, normal guy. He had his hat in his hand over his chest, and a reporter looked at him, and the reporter said, uh, Sir, did you know President Roosevelt? And the guy looks at the reporter, and he says, uh, No. I didn't know President Roosevelt, but he knew me. He knew me. That is empathy. That is what is missing right now in the White House. And I will tell you this. If you are someone that's struggling to pay for your rent by making your paycheck stretch even longer than it should, I know you, and I will fight for you. If you can't decide between filling your refrigerator or your prescription drugs like so many people in our country, I know you and I will fight for you. And if you have a hard time deciding, am I going to pay for long-term care for my parents or am I going to pay for child care for my kids, I know you and I will fight for you. That's what this election is about. Because when you start thinking of it... When you start thinking of it through those eyes and put yourself in someone else's shoes, then it starts to make sense. And I can't wait to debate Donald Trump. I can't wait because, for one thing, 
I'm going to be able to say to him, you know, uh, the Midwest is not flyover country to me. I live there. And the people that you are treating like poker chips in your bankrupt casinos with how you're building up the debt and engaging in this trade war, uh, they are not poker chips to me. They are my friends and they are my neighbors. And then the best part of all, I'm going to be able to look at him and say, you know, you started your life. Uh, over your career, you got $413 million from your family, from your dad. Me, this is my story. My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the iron ore mines up in northern Minnesota. He had nine brothers and sisters. He never got to graduate from high school because he had to go to work because he was the oldest boy. And every single day, he'd go down in that cage with a lunch bucket that my grandma would pack. And every single week, the sirens would go off in some way, and people would start running to the mines because they didn't know if it was their dad or their brother or their kid that had gotten injured or killed. It was unions that made those mines safer. It was unions. It was courts that made those mines safer. And my grandpa, it enabled him over time to save money in a coffee can in the basement, along with my grandma, to send my dad to a two-year community college. And then he went on to graduate from the University of Minnesota with a four-year degree in journalism. He went on to really travel the world and write stories, write adventure stories, cover the Vikings. He, uh, yeah, he once wrote a book called Will the Vikings Ever Win the Super Bowl? <laughs> and sadly, it is still relevant today. It was written in the early 80s, but that, that was his story. And then my mom grew up in Milwaukee, uh, which is going to be the site of our Democratic Convention. And she grew up with no money. She wanted to be a teacher. She moved to Minnesota, and she taught second grade until she was 70 years old. And I stand before you today. I stand before you today as a granddaughter of an iron ore miner, the daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Minnesota, and a candidate for the President of the United States. That's because we live in a country of shared dreams. That no matter where you come from, or who you know, or who you love, or the color of your skin, or where you worship, that you can make it in the United States of America. And so when I think about that coffee can in my grandpa's basement, $413 million would never have fit in that coffee can. <laughs> And I figure if someone gives you an opportunity, whether it be a parent or a grandparent, whether it's a teacher, whether it's one of your teachers here at the school, uh, whether it is someone you work with, uh, that you cherish that opportunity. You do not go into the world with a sense of entitlement. You go into the world with a sense of obligation, obligation to lift people up instead of shutting them down, obligation to bring people with you instead of hoarding it for yourself. So that is what is at stake here. That's what's at stake. And the way we really move people is one, not to go down every rabbit hole with him. We've learned that, right? He tries to distract us every single day. Two, to be able to be tough enough to take him on. And I think now you've seen, after I don't know what, it feels like 10 debates, uh, that I am tough enough to take him on, on the debate stage, and nimble enough to do it. The third thing is we have to have an optimistic economic agenda. Uh, we need to bring people with us, and we can't get, let it get lost. How do you do that? Well, one, you look at the challenges that people are facing, the challenge of health care. So that was a bit of a disagreement <laughs> over the last few debates, but I still point out that what unites us is bigger than what divides us. I look at it first as I am practically and bluntly. Okay, the Affordable Care Act, signature work of Barack Obama, is now nearly 10 points more popular than the President of the United States, as in Donald Trump. So. And he is desperately trying to get rid of it. That's what he's doing right now in Texas, to take people's protections away from them. So I don't really think we should blow it up. Uh, when we come to a lake or a river, given where we are, 
uh, we tend to build bridges and not blow them up. So this is what I would do. I would do a nonprofit public option to bring down the premiums and cover more people. That is exactly what Barack Obama wanted to do. I would secondly do something that was not done in the Affordable Care Act, that should have been done in the Affordable Care Act, and that, take, and that means take on the pharmaceutical companies in a big, big way. They literally, why do we talk about this a lot? Well, we know why you care about it, because everyone's drug prices have gone up, but why do we talk about it? Those of us that are in the arena, we see it. Two lobbyists for every member of Congress. Two lobbyists. They think they own Congress, and they probably do. They literally got written into law before I got there, a provision that said Medicare is banned from negotiating better prices for seniors. Medicaid can do it. VA can do it, but not Medicare. And that's when I got there, I started leading the bill to unleash the power of 45 million seniors, which will help everyone, by the way, uh, to finally get to negotiate less expensive drugs under Medicare. As president, I will be able to get it done. Um, Something that came up on the debate stage last night, which is bringing less expensive drugs in from other countries. That's a bill that Bernie and I did as an amendment late at night at midnight when we got 14 Republican votes. I still think they were too tired, but they voted with us. We got those votes. Uh, I now have it as a bipartisan bill with Senator Grassley. We can get this done. In the northern states, we can see Canada from our porch. Uh, we know how less expensive those drugs are, and we can get that done, putting a cap on the prices. You can just literally go through all these ideas. The public is with this, and I can get this done. Secondly, uh, mental health and addiction. Uh, for me, this is personal, and that's why I came out so strongly with a policy on opioids, yes, but also mental health, also doing something about other forms of addiction. Uh, it's personal because when I was growing up, my dad struggled with alcoholism. Uh, by the time my husband and I got married, he had his third DWI. And then the judge looked at him and he said, you gotta choose, jail or treatment. And my dad chose treatment. And in his words, he was pursued by grace and it changed his life. Uh, and I think everyone has that same right. Uh, no matter what addiction or what mental illness they are struggling with. And for him, it was his treatment, his faith, his friends, his family uh, that got him through that. He is now 91, he's in assisted living. Uh, his AA group visits him there, uh, and in his words, it's hard to get a drink around here anyway. <laughs> Leading me to really the next thing, which is long-term care. And I know there's a lot of students here, you think it doesn't affect you, but all this stuff does affect you. Uh, because the way this is being handled right now is going to affect everyone in America, not only you in the future, and not only your parents and your grandparents, uh, but it's gonna affect a lot of people that are in the middle that are trying to raise kids and take care of their aging parents. That's why strong social security, doing something when it comes to Medicaid and keeping it strong and then making it easier for people to buy long-term care insurance um, and making it easier for people to stay in their homes or build senior housing. Housing is such a problem in New Hampshire um, and trying to get more incentives in place to do that and help people to afford it. Uh, in my uh, dad's case, he is in assisted living, as I mentioned. I know exactly when that long-term care insurance, which for some reason he bought, which was great, is gonna run out. Uh, that's a year and a half from now. Then we go into his savings, not as big as they should be. He got married three times, we won't go into that. Uh, then he goes on Medicaid and he can't stay where he is anymore. Uh, then he goes to Catholic elder care. They said he'd take him in because a place he stays doesn't take Medicaid. Uh, there are many stories that are so much harder than that one, but there's stories all over America. And that's why I am devoted to taking this on instead of spending the entire next four years relitigating the Affordable Care Act. Instead, we should build on it and take on the challenges that are right in front of us. <laughs> next. What are other challenges? Education, right? How we connect our education system with our economy. And I know some of my opponents out there, really for both subjects I've just talked about, have easy solutions that really look good on a bumper sticker, like free college for all. And I understand why that's appealing. But I just want you to listen and hear me out and think about how this works. We need to match our education system with our economy. 
That's what we need to do. And we know we're going to have a whole lot of need for four-year degrees and beyond. We don't have enough doctors. I mean, you can name it. We have a lot of needs for advanced degrees. That's why I would double the Pell Grants from six to 12000 a year. They can be used at private institutions as well as public. I would double the income level where people qualify for those Pell Grants. Remember, Pell Grants aren't loans. They're really good stuff, right? You get the money. I would double the amount of income and that I would make it easier for people to pay back their loans that go into public service. Um, and by the way, that's really easy to do. I can do it in my first 100 seconds of my first 100 days. That is fire Betsy DeVos. Um, and And that is how you can change that program. But then you got to make it work better with making it phased in better over 10 years, adding in-demand occupations, making it easier for students to refinance their student loans. How would I pay for all this, by the way? By taking the capital gains rate and bringing it closer to the personal income tax rate, um, which a lot of people agree uh, is a good idea. You could still leave some incentives for long-term investment. But that would bring us like $500 billion right there to help people with uh, paying for college. OK, but here's the biggie. So let's look at what our economy is showing us right now. In addition to all those jobs I just mentioned, the high-end jobs and those uh, high-degree jobs, we know this. We are going to have over a million openings for home health care workers in the next 10 years, partly because of the aging of our population. We are going to have over 100,000 openings for nursing assistants, which are one- and two-year degrees. We are going to have over 70,000 openings for electricians, which actually pay really well. Uh, we are going to have a shortage. OK, now I'm going to get in trouble. Not of sports marketing degrees. I know. I know someone out there has one or is getting one or has a kid. But that is not going to be our shortage. Our shortage is going to be of plumbers. That is a fact. So when we look at how we match these things up, what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to invest in K through 12 big time and preschool, uh, because that starts everyone on an even playing field. Secondly, one and two year degrees, I would make those free, including apprenticeships, because those are the fastest growing jobs in America right now. And then third, the doubling of the Pell Grants and all that to help with students uh, in public and private colleges uh, throughout our country. And there's a lot of students, including, as you heard my dad's story, and my sister, who actually didn't graduate from high school. She had some trouble. She got her GED. She worked, she, well, first she worked in manufacturing, then she got her GED, then she got a two-year degree, then she got a four-year degree, and she's been gainfully employed as an accountant ever since. So there are a lot of stories of students that also start out at two-year degrees. Some of them go right into good-paying jobs, some of them going into jobs that aren't as good paying, and that's why we need child care and retirement, all of these things I've talked about, changing the way we do retirement with the gig economy. Um, and then many of them then, about half of them, go on to get four-year degrees other places. So we just have to look at that as a reality and see that there are many, many paths to success in this country. Uh, last thing, because there are many challenges we've got here, climate change. Uh, that is a... Um, that is something uh, where I think someone from the Midwest uh, and a northern state can uniquely talk about it because I've been out to the Greenland ice sheet. I've seen what's happening there. Uh, we see the issues, uh, huge, huge problems with the rising sea levels and the fires that we're seeing in California. And I actually think if anyone wants a one-minute teaching moment on what climate change means right now, it is watching the video of that dad driving his little girl out of the neighborhood, which is on fire in paradise, and she is so scared, and he is singing to her as the flames are going over their car. That is climate change that's happening right now. But for people in Minnesota and New Hampshire and in the Midwest and in places uh, like North and South Dakota, I think it is really important to talk about a lot of things, like what we're seeing, record flooding in the middle of the country, uh, land that's too wet to harvest or too wet to plant, the rising homeowner insurance rates, which is something that makes it real when you talk to insurance agents about what is happening, uh, the effect on wildlife, 
wildlife like here, moose and loons. I had to mention loons, that's our state bird in Minnesota. Moose and loons, the fishing industry off the coast of Maine, uh, from lobsters to oysters. Uh, what we're seeing with the silver maple, someone just told me about this. When you think about the tourism industry in New Hampshire, which is such a driving force of the economy, huge changes going on with the trees and our foliage. How do you think that's going to affect tourism in New Hampshire? So. That's what I'm talking about. We need to make that direct case. And then we need to have policies that work. And on day one, I would get us back into the International Climate Change Agreement. On day two, I would bring back the clean power rules, something the Obama administration had negotiated over years. On day three, bring back the gas mileage standards, which would be good for consumers, bring our costs down. And then on day four, introduce sweeping legislation to put a price on carbon and energy efficiency. And And on day seven, I would rest. Not really. I wouldn't really rest. OK, so when you look how we do this, though, and here's the key part why I think we failed in the past. I was on the Environmental Committee when we tried to get cap and trade done. Of course, I supported that bill. Um, but we need to make this airtight so people that know, especially in northern states, that they're going to see changes in their heating bills, that they're made whole. And by the way, we can do this because we're going to bring in trillions of dollars when you start putting either a fee on fossil fuel or you do it with cap and trade or you do it with a national renewable electricity standard. However which way we do it or a combination of those, those money has to go back directly as dividends to people. It's got to be very clear or we're not going to get the votes to do it and it'll be a bad policy because we don't want to laden people with more costs. Also, for people in areas where they're going to see job changes, of course, a lot of areas are going to see job increases. But for people that are going to see changes, we've got to put money there to invest in all kinds of jobs, not just green energy jobs. Uh, for me, this is not just from my head. It's from my heart. Uh, I mentioned my grandpa. Um, way back uh, outside of Duluth there and on the Iron Range, the mines would close, they'd open up. Uh, we'd see problems in the economy. Uh, I remember still the billboard outside of Duluth that someone put up. This is the billboard that said, last one to leave, turn off the lights. We can't let that happen. And so having that experience in my own life, by the way, right now Duluth is booming under two feet of snow, but tourism and, and a bunch of businesses that were brought in there, the work we've done with steel dumping to take that on so the iron ore mines could open again, a bunch of stuff has contributed to that. But I feel it in my heart because I know what that's like. And I think that's going to make a big difference uh, when we try to get something done on climate change. So those are a few of the challenges. But the key thing here is to remember again, economic check, yes. Putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that maybe aren't with us on every other issue, yes. And then this decency check. That has got to be key. Because that's what I hear a lot out there. They really, really, really don't want four years of this guy. Uh, they do not want to see, what would I call his playbook, three words, three words, divide and demoralize. My three words will be unite and lead. So here is, um, here is my last pitch to you. <laughs> so I know, as I said, you know, I'm not the candidate that's number one right now, but we are surging. As someone told me in an auto text that went bad, uh, congratulations on your insurgency. Um, <laughs> And I ask you uh, to ask your friends that aren't here today, tell them about me, but ask them to read the New York Times editorial that endorsed me and endorsed my friend Elizabeth. They endorsed both of us. Uh, have them look at the union leader that endorsed me. The Seacoast newspapers, including Portsmouth and a number of other papers, they endorse me. Actually, all three newspapers in New Hampshire, Keen Sentinel, endorse me. So read those endorsements because they kind of lay it all out by people that I had appear before, sometimes for an hour and a half, two hours, answer every question on every single issue, including foreign relations, including showing how I was going to bring sanity back to our foreign policy. Um, talk to uh, former Brigadier General 
Smith, who was the ambassador to Saudi Arabia from New Hampshire, who's endorsed me, who's out right now campaigning for me with Joe Sestek, uh, the former presidential candidate who somehow tried to walk across New Hampshire in a blizzard, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, um, the point is this is that I am someone that brings people with me. I have always done that. I have won every race, every place, every time, all the way down to fourth grade, uh, where my, <laughs> the guys are always boasting about things, so I do that. Um, <laughs> where my slogan uh, was all the way with Amy Kay, which I have since abandoned. <laughs> and I have won in the reddest, reddest of congressional districts, not in a fluke once, every single time, the rural districts held by Republicans, where the steel workers are in northern Minnesota. I have won Michelle Bachman's district, her congressional <laughs> district, every single time. And I do it by going not just where it is comfortable, but where it is uncomfortable. So there's a lot of connections between Dartmouth and this town and this area and my state, because we look the same, I guess. The states do, the forests do, everything does. So call people you know in Minnesota. There's five million people. You can get a job reference for me. You got three days to get it done. Um, and I think the key thing for me here um, is that we truly need someone who is not a divider in chief. We don't need, we're not gonna be able to out divide this guy. And you know, I may be, not be the tallest person in the room, and please note that James Madison was five foot four. <laughs> um, I may not be the loudest person in the room, but I bring to this race something that is very special, and that is that I have defied every expectations every step of the way. There were so many people when I announced in the middle of the blizzard with four inches of snow on my head just to impress New Hampshire, they actually thought, I'm not kidding, I don't know if she's gonna be able to do this announcement. Is she gonna make it through this speech? I did, in a big way. Uh, they didn't think I was gonna make it through the summer. They didn't gonna think I'm gonna make it on every debate stage and I'm already headed to Nevada. Every step of the way, I have defied expectations. Um, my favorite story in that, my daughter, when she was about four years old, she had a friend over there playing with dolls. I walked by the room and I heard the older girl say to her, one day soon I'm gonna have a baby, just like this doll. And I thought, what is my daughter gonna say? I stood there with these towels in my hand and she said, oh, I'm gonna have a baby too, but not for a long, long time because you can't have a baby until you run for office and win an election. And I'm like, yes, okay, that. That is high expectations that we need to have. We just can't write this off. We need to keep going. So I am not gonna be able to do this without you. I spent two of the last weeks uh, in that impeachment hearing because it was my constitutional duty. And I don't regret one day of it, but it took me off that trail. And so I need to double down on these four days now three days, uh, that is really all I have. Um, and I'm gonna need you because I know that if more people are doing it, then there's like hundreds of me out there instead of one. Um, I have the color green because of one of my political mentors, Paul Wellstone. And um, he, for those of you that don't know him because you were too young when he was serving in the U.S. Senate, he defied the odds. He ran against a multimillionaire and no one thought he was gonna win and he won. And he would win his race by running ads because he had hardly any money where he would talk really, really fast and try to get everything in in 30 seconds. That's what he would do because he didn't have as much money as his opponent. And then he would also run back and forth really, really fast in these parades. And the last year of his life uh, when he tragically died in a plane crash uh, with his wife Sheila and their daughter Marsha and their staff. That year I had no opponent, which sounds really nice. And so I uh, got to spend a lot of time with him and I got to see what he did. He had told the state that he had MS and so he was in a lot of pain. He also had taken a really hard vote against the war in Iraq, which was the right thing to do, but he was still gonna win in a tough election. He was the only one that did that, that's courage. And then 
I saw how he struggled. He couldn't run anymore. He couldn't even walk anymore. So what he would do instead was stand on the back of his green bus in those parades, and he would wave. But here's the amazing part. He had energized so many people in these green shirts to run around that bus, and there was so much energy that you didn't even notice he wasn't running himself. That's what I am asking you to do for me in that in these last three days. I think you know in your heart I can do this. And I think you know that the playing field is not exactly even in this race. And if you haven't watched that debate, watch it. Or watch any of the debates. You will see that I'm someone that's tough enough to take this guy on. And I'm someone that has the ideas and the experience to put them into action. All I need is your vote. So I'm asking you for that today. This is it. New Hampshire has a huge role. You're the first primary. You're going to be able to count the votes. Uh, you are going to be able to get this thing done. So let's go. Let's win this.